Well, my name is Beth Gibson. Uh, what you see up there, thanks, uh, is I am with the University of Florida. I'm in part of the occupational therapy department. Uh, I wear several different hats. So part of my job is clinical lecturer. I do teach. Uh, then I am part of research. So I do assist with research. Currently, I'm assisting with a research project with Parkinson's, which I'll be talking about. And then I also am the manager of the Smart Driver Rehabilitation Program. So the little letters after my name, OTRL just means I'm an occupational therapist. CDRS means I'm a certified driver rehabilitation specialist. So I've worked in this field of driver rehabilitation for 26 years now. Uh, so with that hat on, I actually assess people's driving to determine whether they should still be on the road, if there's modifications, if there's equipment, what do we need to do? So I do those three kind of totally separate jobs. Uh, on the screen at the moment, you also see Dr. Shirlene Clausen. She is the chair of the Department of Occupational Therapy. She is also the principal investigator of the studies that I'm going to talk about. Uh, unfortunately, she had, she had hoped to be here to present, but she's at another conference. <laughs> so, uh, but Dr. Clausen has been researching driving for at least 20 years. So there's a lot of driving research that goes on through the Department of Occupational Therapy. When we think of driving, one of the things you need to know about now, we're going to talk terminology. So IADL is just OT's way of saying it's called instrumental activities of daily living. And what we mean by that is regular activities of daily living are things like dressing yourself and feeding yourself and bathing yourself. Instrumental activities of daily living are more complex. Driving is one of them. Money management, medication management, cooking, those are more complicated. They take a lot more skills than the other just self-care things. Um, they're going to involve needing to have potentially intact vision, cognition, uh, motor functions. You've got to coordinate things in different ways. They're more complicated activities. You're dealing with a dynamic environment. So that's one of the biggest things in driving is, you know, it's never the same twice. Even if you're just going back and forth to work or back and forth to some other activity, you know, the grocery store that you go to every couple of days. It's a different drive every time because you're out there with different people. The weather may be different. The lighting may be different depending on the time of day you're driving. So it's always changing, and you're having to adapt to those changes both in the environment and even in sometimes how you're feeling that day. You have to have control over the vehicle. You have to be able to be safe. You have to react to the people around you. So we're really integrating the person. You know, how are you performing? How are you feeling? the vehicle. So what kind of vehicle do you have? If you're like me and you've got an older vehicle, it's dumb and it doesn't do anything special. Uh, if you're someone who has a newer vehicle, it may do all kinds of things. You know, it may halfway take you there. Uh, and then the environment, you know, like I was saying a moment ago, is it raining? Is it foggy out? I mean, I, I'm a recent transplant to Gainesville and I have never driven in so much fog in my life. So a lot of mornings I'm just crossing my fingers that other people are remembering that they need to have their headlights on in the fog as I'm merging onto the interstate. So that's an important part. We all need to remember that driving is a privilege, not a right. You know, a lot of times people say, you know, they can't take away my license. They can't do it. Yeah, they can. <laughs> you know, so I mean, we all got our licenses in the first place, right? We all had to go down there and take the little test. Maybe we had to parallel park or whatever we had to do. But all of us had to take a test to get our license in the first place. There's a governmental agency, no matter, you know, where you're listening to this from, that regulates driver's licenses. They're the ones that decide if you get to have a license or you don't get to have a license. You know, that's that's their rules. If you don't maintain, you know, like in Florida, if you don't maintain your auto insurance, they take away your license. You know, it's got nothing to do with whether you're a good driver or not. You didn't keep up your insurance. They don't let you have a license. So some things are very administrative. Some things are more having to do with the, the driver's function. Do they have a lot of citations? You know, different things like that. What we like to say, and one of the reasons I guess there aren't as many people that do what I do, is this is the only activity that most of us do that could actually kill us or kill somebody else. And so that's where it becomes just so important to make sure that your abilities are appropriate to the environment you're trying to drive in. I just moved here from Atlanta, 
any of you have, who have driven through Atlanta know that the traffic level in Atlanta compared to Gainesville is very different. <laughs> the roadways are very different. The demands, both cognitive, physical, and otherwise, are very different. When people here tell me about the traffic, I'm like, oh, you're so cute. You think you have traffic. You know, to me, you know, a little bit of backup on Newberry Road in the afternoon is not the same as 10 lanes of traffic on the downtown connector in the rain. You know, so it's very different. But again, that means that sometimes I can say, well, in the environment you're in, your skills are appropriate. If you went back to that environment, your skills might not be appropriate. So the environment really does factor into whether it's okay. And, you know, driving, sometimes people say, you don't know how this important this is to me. I wouldn't have given, you know, a quarter of a century to this activity if I didn't know how important this was. Because you need to get to the store. You need to go see your friends. You want to go to church. You got to get your hair done. You don't want to ask everybody to give you rides places. Obviously, driving is important. It's how you keep up with your community. Obviously, in the last couple of years, we've learned there are other ways to keep up. We can do it remotely and so forth. But it doesn't feel the same. It's better than nothing. But, you know, and we can order groceries and we can do a lot of other things. And that's helpful and time-saving. And people who have no disabilities do some of those things. But it's also, what do you want to do? What do you, what, how do you want to be doing your life? So, you know, driving does come into all of that. Now, driving in the future is going to, you know, as there's more autonomy built into vehicles, we're going to be giving up some control. You know, those of you that are as old as me remember when cars came out with cruise control in the first place. And I still remember the first time my dad took me out and I thought, Oh, hell no. You know, this is taking over the car. It's going to kill me. And I just sat there with my foot hovering over the brake thinking we're going to die. Now I don't think twice about using cruise control. But the first time I used it many years ago, petrified me. So with some of the features that are coming out in newer vehicles, we're giving up more and more control. And that's part of what our study is about. Uh, we have to have the confidence in the technology. You know, how many times has something that you use for technology, you know, your Google Assistant. I mean, we had a laugh that we had ours set to turn on a certain light, and every time I would say, turn on the bump, which is what we nicknamed the light, it would say, thumb pain. And it's like, no, I'm not talking about thumb pain. How that sounds like bump, I don't know. But, you know, if I was trusting that to <laughs> take me somewhere, I don't think I would trust that to take me somewhere. Uh, so you have to have trust in the system, though, for the system to be useful. You have to understand the levels of automation. I had an interesting argument with a man at a party where we were, you know, he was thoroughly convinced that it was perfectly fine for him to have several cocktails and have his Tesla take him home. And I was of the opinion that that was not really a good idea. So, you know, knowing what the car really is capable of doing, and of course different cars are capable of different things. You know, today we've got a wide range of different features in different vehicles and understanding when they talk about these features what it really will do. The SAE is the Society of Automotive Engineers and they're the ones that set what is involved at different levels and we'll talk about a couple of the levels. It's going to involve us changing our roles, right? We've always been drivers and we've been in control of the car and just like I was saying when cruise control first came out, I didn't feel like I was in control of the car. It was just taking me down the interstate, and I did not like the experience. But again, I've gotten used to that. But I'm still paying attention to the traffic ahead of me. I'm still staying in my lane. I'm still doing all those things. It was just keeping up with my speed, right? That was a little loss of control. In today's cars, there's a lot more things the car can do for you. You know, if you've watched some of the commercials where people, you know, hit something on their phone and their car comes out of the parking space and drives over to them. I mean, there's things now that, you know, we imagined, but we didn't expect. Uh, we're going to be moving to be more of a vehicle operator than maybe the driver of the vehicle. And eventually, we may get to the point where we're the passenger and we're just along. We've programmed in our destination and it really does take us there. We may be, you know, a dispatcher. Our kid needs to be picked up from school. You plug something in and it sends a vehicle to the school to pick up the kid. You're not even there. So, you know, we may get to that point. Are we there yet? No, we're not there yet. <laughs> but is that on the horizon? Yes. How close? A little hard to say. 
you need to be tech savvy. I mean, that's one of the challenges. You know, my husband very much likes to say that he's a Luddite and he <laughs> does not like technology. We just had to replace his car and he bought a used car and he's thrilled that it doesn't do a darn thing. You know, it doesn't have any special features and he's happy with that. At some point, he will have to evolve, but at this point, he was happy to be able to still get something that didn't do anything other than what he wants it to do. And you have to understand the lingo. Again, you watch all these different car commercials, and they're talking about different features, and they're showing you different things on the commercials, and you may go to a car dealership, and they're telling you all the features. And what's a challenge right now is there is no standardization. So what... Toyota calls something and what Honda calls something and what Ford calls something and what Volvo calls something, they may all be talking about the same thing and use different terms for each one of them because that's their proprietary name for their system. But you really want to understand that they may not all be equivalent. This one may do this and this one may do this and they kind of sound alike but they're not the same or they may sound very different and be exactly the same system. So you want to understand what are we really talking about. So there's two main things. One is in vehicle information systems. Now this is level zero, right? So meaning it does, you know, not very smart. But it provides you information or warnings. So it's not doing something for you. It's just saying, hey, heads up, something's going on. So it's not going to assume any of the functions of the task. So an example of that would be backup camera, right? They've, they've been mandated for a few years now. Now those of us that have an older car may still not have a backup camera. The backup camera doesn't keep you from hitting anything behind you, it just shows you what's back there, you know, which is great. And if you've got a more sophisticated one, it may give you a little feature that shows you the path your car is going to take as you turn the wheel so that you know where it's going to go. So it's giving you a little more information. But it still doesn't keep you from running into the garbage can or hitting the wall. It just says, oh, look, you're coming. Yep, there's the wall. You know, now you also may have front collision warning. So it may warn you that you're coming up too fast on the vehicles in front of you or that there's something in front of you like you're pulling up to the wall and it's going beep, 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 beep. You know, it may give you a little jiggle. Uh, it may give you a little clue, but it's not going to stop the car. It's going to be like, you're hitting, you're going to hit, you're going to hit. Yeah, you hit. You know, <laughs> but it's not stopping you. It's only warning you. So that's an information system. It's giving you more information than you had before, but it's not taking over. So it may allow for that, you know, you can set it for how much space you want between you and the vehicle in front of you, and if you close that gap either faster than you should or more, it's going to start warning you. So you're still the driver. You're the one still in charge. Then we're going to go to levels one and two. And the, and the main difference between one and two is two has more features. One only has to have one feature. So... Now we're starting to have sensors that are looking in the environment and things that where the car is actually doing some things for you. And so it's going to maybe help you recognize things. It may help you react things for potentially dangerous situations. So these are stepping stones to having fully autonomous technology for the vehicle actually being the thing that's taking you there, not you driving the vehicle. These can include things like automatic emergency braking. So you've watched those commercials where, you know, the, the man's pulling up in, the, in traffic and starts to spill his coffee and the car suddenly stops because he's coming up behind somebody he didn't see. You know, those types of features. Crash avoidance where, you know, a kid runs in a road or something and the car stopped before the vehicle hit it, but the driver hadn't even reacted yet. Lane departure correction. So some cars just have lane departure warnings where it's going to beep and say, like, you're leaving your lane. Hey, watch out. You're leaving your lane. Correction would be the car is actually going, let's get back where we belong. <laughs> let's actually steer. So it actually gently will steer you back if you haven't told it by signaling that you intend to leave your lane. And then blind spot. You know, sometimes you've just got the little things that light up on your mirrors that say there's somebody in your blind spot. In some cases, if the vehicle's more advanced, it's not going to let you move if it detects somebody. So right now, you know, a lot of vehicles, it's just lighting up. There's somebody there, but you could still choose to move over and, <laughs> and ignore it if you're not paying attention. So, again, these features are helping you, not just alerting you. So you're still the driver. 
for the most part. So in the study that we're doing, looking at autonomous vehicle features, so not a fully autonomous vehicle, autonomous vehicle features and Parkinson's, uh, previous studies have shown that people with Parkinson's make more driving errors. Uh, that's been shown in the simulator compared to healthy controls, so they compared in a simulator. And one of the reasons for doing things in a simulator is you can make it exactly the same. Like I was saying earlier, your drive to work isn't the same every day, even if you take the same route. So if we put two people in the simulator and run the same program, they have the exact same drive. Whereas if I take you on the road and I drove with you in the morning and you in the afternoon, it's not going to be the exactly the same drive. So that's where simulation does come in, in handy. But we've also shown in various studies that people with Parkinson's make significantly more errors in speeding, in lane exceedance, and what we mean by that is losing your lane position, uh, and in signaling, which are predictive of poorer performance on the road and also have shown to be an indicator of being more likely to fail an actual road test if you are being evaluated. So the idea is that if we're using some of these technologies, will that help people with Parkinson's make fewer mistakes and therefore continue to drive longer because they're not making the errors that would cause them to say, I need to stop driving? So, you know, specifically we're looking at things like speeding, at losing lane position, signaling errors. And so in the study, we drive a route through Gainesville with the these different features turned on, we drive the same route with the different features turned off, and then we compare the two performances to see was there a difference in those two circumstances. Uh, oh, just to throw in there that set of letters at the bottom, I had to write it down because I can never remember. Uh, the funding for this study is through the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research. So that's that Nidler that we've got at the bottom. So they are funding this study. Our goal is to have 105 participants that have mild to moderate Parkinson's. Uh, there's a pretest and a post-test design. We come out of the Fixel Institute, so that's where we meet the participants. And then we have a road course through Gainesville that we drive. We use an accessible 2019 Camry. Uh, it's got a lot of different <laughs> features to it. It's got the blind spot detection, the lane departure warning, the adaptive cruise control, and the lane keeping assist. So those are the features specifically that we're looking at in this study. It has more features than that, but those, those are the ones we turn on and off. So with the blind spot detection, you know, many of you have probably seen this either in the vehicle you own or in, in other people's vehicles where the little symbol there lights up if someone's in the car's blind spot to tell you, hey, watch out. You know, what demands are, are involved? You know, you think about when you're making a lane change. You're paying attention to the vehicle in front of you and maintaining your distance. You're checking the mirror and your blind spot to make sure there's nobody next to you. You're matching your speed to the next lane to either speed up or slow down to fall in line with the other vehicles. So you're having to have good enough vision to see what's around you. You're having to ha scan and get the information, not miss anything like someone pulling out of a driveway that may be entering the lane you plan to move into. You have to have good contrast. You know, I was talking about the fog. Trying to see in the fog whether you can merge onto the highway is not an easy thing to do. If you have contrast problems with your vision, it doesn't even necessarily need to be foggy for you to have some difficulty in seeing maybe a gray car coming in the early morning when the lighting is not as bright. So that has to do with contrast. You're having to do more than one thing at a time. And so, you know, you're maintaining your speed and adjusting your speed, you're staying in your lane, you're checking your mirrors. So you're doing multiple things at once. You know, most of us think, well, what's, what's the big deal about making a lane change? I've done six billion lane changes in the 50 years I've been driving. But we fail to think that there's many different things going on. It's just when we're healthy, and, we're, and nothing's wrong, it's easy. <laughs> when some of those things change, it becomes not so easy. So there's an auditory beep. It will also potentially prevent you, depending on what you're trying to do, from making that error if you start to go anyway, even though the thing is saying, please don't go, there's somebody there. With the lane departure warning system, there's sensors, and that's what the picture is showing that 
look around the vehicle and it's determining whether you're in the lane. Now, an important thing to understand about these systems is they don't work all the time. Now, there's an aspect of you can actually choose to turn them on and off, but they also only work at certain speeds. So the lane departure system doesn't work until you're going at least 32 miles an hour. So if we're on a lower speed residential street, it's not active, it's not working. So we actually had someone that purchased a very expensive vehicle thinking that it was going to solve a lot of their problems only to realize that on a lot of the roads they drove on, it wouldn't actually do anything. So you have to, again, understand how these systems really work. But it's looking for you to be centered in your lane. It only can determine that if there's lane markings. So if you drive a lot of roads that don't have any markings, it doesn't know what, where you are either <laughs> any more than you do. Um, and so, you know, but this is important because sometimes when you're checking traffic and looking around, your body may, you know, the brain wants to go, wants you to go where you're looking. So if you're spending too much time looking or maybe you're a little stiff and as you turn your body and head, your shoulders are going more than they would because you're a little bit stiff, maybe you're starting to veer out of your lane a little bit as you're just trying to check the traffic or just to check around for hazards or things. So it uses visual and auditory and haptic as means that it like do a little jiggle in the wheel. Um, some vehicles you may get a jiggle in your seat that's giving you the warning like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm heads up, tune in, I'm starting to leave my lane. Uh, if you're starting to drift. Now, if you're making a lane change and you put your signal on, it knows you mean to do it and then it doesn't complain because it knows it was intentional as opposed to an unintentional loss of position. So lane keeping assist is more complicated than just the warning. It's actually keeping you in your lane. So if you start to leave your lane, it actually will pull you back. It's not just saying, hey, you're over too far. It's actually going to bring you back into your lane. So if you're somebody who has a bad habit, like a lot of people out there, of not using your turn signals, you're going to be like starting to move and the car is like, nope, <laughs> wait a minute, nope, use your signal and it'll let you move. <laughs> so, you know, this is a feature that sometimes takes some getting used to if you have some bad habits maybe you're not aware of. Um, but again, you know, you think about the different, again, cognitive demands and physical demands. You know, if I've checked my mirror and I see somebody and then I look away and then I think about moving then, I have to remember, oh yeah, I need to look and see where did that blue car go that was there a minute ago. Because maybe it turned off and it's not there anymore or maybe it's moved into more into my blind spot or somewhere else where I don't know where it is. But if I forget there was a car over there, I may just start to move. So you have to remember, or like the guy you saw in your rear view mirror, well, he's not there anymore. Where'd he go? <laughs> you know, I have to look and see where did he go to see if it's going to affect what I'm doing. So all of those things are important. But it's going to deal with steering and braking to prevent you from making these errors. The adaptive cruise control, what that does is unlike normal, you know, plane cruise control that we've had for 40 some odd years, uh, you set your speed and, you know, before when you would use control, you set your speed and if you start coming up, you catch up to some other traffic and that traffic is moving slower than you, you hit your brake, you turn off the cruise control and you take over again so that you deal with the traffic. What adaptive cruise control does is actually slow down. So if we're out on the interstate and we set ourselves to 70 and we come up behind someone going 60, the car is actually going to slow itself down. If we make a lane change and there's nobody in front of us, the car will speed back up to that 70 we set. So it's not going to take you any faster than you set it, but it may slow you down and speed you up depending on what the vehicles in front of you do. You can actually choose, and the little yellow lines in the picture are showing, you can choose your distance. So some people may choose a little tighter distance, some people may choose a little more generous distance, but that's the distance it's going to maintain between you and the vehicle in front of you. Now these systems aren't perfect, so sometimes if some fool makes a quick lane change and gets in that nice little gap you've left, it may or may not feel like it reacts fast enough and you may still end up feeling like you need to take back over again and deal with that. Or somebody who's maybe coming onto the interstate and sneaks in front of you kind of thing. But, you know, again, part of what happens on the on a situation like an interstate where you're trying to keep your speed up, you know, you're 
watching the gap and you're trying to measure that gap between you and the vehicle in front of you. You're trying to maintain your speed when you're just kind of going along without a lot of speeding up and slowing down because of traffic lights and things. When people start to have difficulty with processing speed, what we'll see is that they just start driving a little bit slower and a little bit slower and a little bit slower. And part of the reason for that is because that gives them more time to make decisions. It gives them a little more flexibility in what they're doing. But the challenge becomes if everybody around you is doing 70 or 80 and you're doing 50 because you've slowed the world down for yourself, that may have created an unsafe situation. It may not be illegal because you're going faster than the minimum speed for that road, but it may still be dangerous because the cars coming up behind you are not expecting you to be going 20 miles under the speed limit and you're hoping they notice like, ooh, I have to slow down because this person's going slow. So it helps you avoid misjudging the gaps in traffic. It helps to keep your speed where it needs to so you're not having to pay as much attention to your speed and it compensates for your ability to keep up with the flow of traffic. You know, I certainly notice myself like driving at night when there's fewer visual cues, I'll all of a sudden look down and realize I'm going slower because I'm not having the cues from the environment that help me know like, oh, I'm not going as fast because the world isn't going by at a speed that, you know, you're used to judging. So it actually has radar and it will adjust the speed, you know, and the gap between you and the vehicle in front of you and so that keeps you having that safe headway. One of the biggest challenges that people have, you know, whether we've got good reaction time or bad, if we don't leave in the big enough gap in front of us, it doesn't matter. The car's only going to stop so fast. So if you're somebody that keeps a very small distance, you've increased your crash risk just by that behavior because the car won't stop in that space. So even if you're paying attention and you think you have good reaction time, there's still physics the car will only stop so fast. So the study, now I'm not expecting you to be able to read this flyer. I have flyers over on my little table, the one with the road cones on it. Um, and if you're interested, feel free to come over and pick up a flyer. But basically the way this study works, uh, you come in, typically you're gonna see me. We look at your vision just to make sure that there's, your vision is legal for driving in this state. We look, we do a cognitive screening because again, we are trying to make sure that our test group has at least a, a minimum level of cognitive function. So we're not dealing with someone who might not be able to understand the systems that we're turning on because some people are very familiar with the systems when we start off. Some people have never seen them and are, you know, if, might not be able to understand them if they've had enough cognitive decline. So we do have a minimum level of that. The physicians come in, uh, Dr. Ramirez and Dr. Patel are the physicians that are helping us with the study. One of them comes in and does a, a motor and a sensory screening. So they do an assessment to make sure that physically you meet the requirements that we've set for participation in the study. And that lets us know, are you someone with a lot of tremors, you know, various features. Because when we crunch the numbers on all this, we can compare things in a lot of ways this group of people maybe had a lot of tremors and this feature maybe helped them more than it helped the people that didn't have tremors or things like that. So, you know, everybody in this room isn't the same. Everybody in our study isn't the same. So we're comparing those things. And so once we get through all that, <laughs> then we go out to the car. So the car has cameras everywhere. So it has cameras on the windows looking at the side mirrors. It has a camera looking at the dashboard. It has a camera looking at your foot. It has a camera between the seats that's catching the movement of your hands. Uh, it has a computer sitting in the back seat that's recording all the alerts and different things that happen in the vehicle system. So it's got stuff everywhere. And then it's got a brake on my side because I'm not crazy. And <laughs> Sometimes people aren't as good a driver as they think, or sometimes things just happen, and it doesn't hurt to have a second set of eyes that maybe can prevent something. So, I, so far, I have not yet had to use it with anybody in the study, but it's there. And so then we drive, as I said earlier, you're randomized into two groups. So one group starts with these technologies turned on, we drive the route, we pause in the Hardee's parking lot, we turn everything off and we drive the same route with it off. Different group will start with all that stuff off, drive the route, stop at Hardee's, turn it on, drive the route. So we've made it where we're looking at both in case there's a difference between starting with it or starting without it. 
and the whole thing takes about two and a half hours of time. So we are not quite halfway through the 105 people we want. So we actually very much need research participants. So whether you're here today or you're hearing online, if you are still driving, if you, if your symptoms aren't too severe, uh, we'd love it if you would volunteer to participate in the study. Uh, we do have, there's a minimum age requirement, but I, I think pretty much everybody's going to meet the minimum requirement. We don't have a maximum age requirement, I don't think. And uh, we'll screen you by phone first just to make sure that you don't fall outside of what works, and then we schedule you to come for a visit. A lot of times folks that are from farther away will schedule around a visit that they have with their neurologist if they do see one here in town. We'll try to schedule around that so that we can do it the same day or the next morning if they're spending the night or something like that. So we do our best to accommodate you. But as I say, it's about two and a half hours and you just meet us at Fixel, we do all this and we're done. We have another study that we're looking at and this one would be open to most folks. Again, the only real exclusion criteria on this one is not having a significant cognitive impairment. But beyond that, people with Parkinson's, but people with MS, people with who have hearing loss, people who have some vision deficits. There's a little autonomous shuttle. If you're somebody that's here in Gainesville, you may have seen the little autonomous shuttle or gotten stuck behind the little autonomous shuttle <laughs> at various points. It doesn't move very fast. Um, but the study is basically looking at people's perceptions. Because just like me, the first time I was out with cruise control, some people think, oh, no, I'm not going to use that stuff. And some people think, like, that's really cool, and I would love to use that stuff. So part of what industry needs to know and developers need to know is what do people think about this technology that's emerging? We do a little question questionnaire session with you ahead of time to get your views. You get to ride the little shuttle. It doesn't, like I say, it doesn't go very fast and it doesn't go very far, but you ride the little shuttle, and then you get asked similar questions afterwards because what we want to see is, okay, here's what you thought about it, just like me. Before you used it, what did you think about it? After you used it, what did you think about it? You may like it more, you may like it less. But we want to know because, again, some of the things that are taken into consideration, if, you know, and particularly people who have mobility challenges, well, they're more likely to be, you would think, earlier adopters of some of this because maybe they can't drive independently anymore. So it's really important for industry to know what features would make folks like that more comfortable because those are some of the people they would hope would use it. So, you know, again, you don't have to be a driver at this point for this one. You just have to have a disability. So I've got flyers for this one. And... For anybody who's not here or for people that just want to jot something down, these are the two graduate assistants that you would call for the two different studies. So the, the first one, PD and AV, that's the actual on-the-road driving study you would call you on, and the one with the little shuttle is Benedict. So they would love <laughs> to have some more participants, so if you're willing, we would very much appreciate it. So now I'm going to change hats, and now I'm going to talk to you as the driving specialist. So just to make sure that nobody wonders about this, because this question has come up, when, even though it's me sitting in the front seat when we're doing the study, I'm not sitting there and assessing your driving. I'm not looking at every decision you make. I'm not doing the things I would normally do in a driving evaluation. I have certain types of errors I'm watching for that are being studied, and that's it. That was a big change in my head that I had to get used to of I'm not looking at everything and I'm not correcting you and I'm not anything else. It's just observation. Now, when you're actually worried about your driving, I had a, a participant the other day who said, you know, well, I've been kind of wondering whether I should still drive. And I thought, well, okay, <laughs> but this isn't what we're doing. We're doing this study. But if you're actually concerned, should I still be on the road? then that's when you come see me in my other capacity as a driving specialist over at Smart Driver. Now, if you're listening to this and you think, well, I don't live in Gainesville, that would not be convenient for me. There are driving specialists around the country and around the state. It's not that it has to be me. And they would be reached in a similar way. So just assume that there's somebody in your, potentially in your area, though there aren't a lot of us, 
that can do this or you can come see us. So just to talk about the types of impairments that we see with people with Parkinson's. The biggest challenge we get is that you might, you know, because it's a progressive disorder and things are changing over time, are you able to keep up and keep compensating for the changes as they come along? You know, that's the hard thing. I mean, all of us, you know, as we're aging, we're having some changes, you know. My neck doesn't turn quite as well to the right as it does to the left anymore. I think that's because I've been in the car for 26 years with people slamming on the brakes. But, you know, those things happen. You know, is my vision quite as good as it was 20 years ago? Probably not. Now I am wearing glasses, obviously, but now I have to have progressive lenses so that I can check off my forms and look at traffic because I can't do both if I don't have, you know, essentially have bifocals. So these things, you know, some things just change naturally over time. And one of the questions sometimes people have is, well, I am seeing changes, but is it my Parkinson's or is it just I'm a little bit older? And so again, those are things we need to look at. Is it, you know, and, and are they significant? Are, am I really still fine? It's just a little different. So looking at the visual, looking at the kind of looking at the motor skills, all of this stuff is important. I have had some people with Parkinson's where we've gone to hand controls because they've lost enough control over their lower body, but they have good control over their upper body. So sometimes we're looking at adaptive equipment. Sometimes we're looking at seating changes. Sometimes someone with Parkinson's, you know, it's not everybody, but some people will get a very hunched posture. And so all of a sudden they're finding that they're kind of looking almost up to be able to see out of the car, which also means they can't really look up <laughs> at the things like the traffic lights that are higher or they're too much of their view is down inside the car because they're having, because of their posture. And maybe we need to do some things with cushions and seating to change, to alter their position in the car so that their gaze is out of the car more than down. So there's a lot of different things. Just coming to see me is not, honestly not an automatic, you're going to lose your license if you go see the mean lady over <laughs> that does driving evaluations. My goal is always to keep people on the road as long as possible as long as they can be safe. So that's always my goal. It's just sometimes people can't be safe. <laughs> and so but studies have shown that people with Parkinson's, when they've studied it in simulators, like I say, so that you can compare apples to apples in terms of everything, they do make more driving errors than age-matched controls. And they are more likely to fail an on-road test, a formal test, than age-matched controls. So it's not just... I'm older, it's, I'm also having these problems from my Parkinson's. In studies that have looked at self-reporting, they do have a higher crash rate than, again, controls. And that higher crash rate has also been shown in simulators where we can let you crash. You know, in the real world, if it looks like we're going to crash, I do hit my little brake and we don't crash. But I do still say, well, we would have crashed <laughs> if I hadn't stopped the car. Um, but in a simulator, we can actually let the crash happen because it doesn't hurt anything. Uh, and it's inconclusive in terms of whether they, people with Parkinson's have higher rates of citations and violations. But if you think about it, you know, how many people in here, if we're all being honest, have deserved more tickets in their life than they've got? You know, how many times have we been like, whoo, okay, Dr. Ramirez raised his hand. I will raise my hand as well. <laughs> you know, most of us have occasionally broken a rule. Maybe it was unintentional. Or like my husband who says, I know the rules I'm breaking. Uh, he is not the model driver. Uh, but, you know, most of us have done things that may not ever had a crash. But we've broken rules. We've broken laws. We've just not been caught. So citation rates, you know, if you're getting the citations, then we should really be concerned because you're doing enough that you're getting caught. Um, but most of us, if we're honest, do things occasionally that we shouldn't. And part of the question is, does it, is it rising to the level where, again, we're talking about safety errors? So I have brochures, again, <laughs> over at my little table. Um, this is just the brochure for Smart Driver. Uh, Smart Driver is uh, a UF health uh, facility. We are also part of the IMAP lab, which is, uh, again, in the Department of Occupational Therapy. So 
we can potentially do some studies through Smart Driver. Right now we're not, but that is a goal in the future is to, to use some of our data that we collect as we do things. Again, it's not identified as yours or yours or yours, but being able to just look at it all together and, and draw some conclusions on things. Uh, so now, this is not a slide that's, this is, this is a busier slide than uh, it should be, so I'll talk in big terms. But what we do in the clinical assessment, so when I get you, one of the things we, that's very important is history. What kind of driver were you or are you so that I know? Somebody who's been a professional truck driver their whole life, I have different expectations of, of somebody who's lived in a small town all their life and just does basic errands and doesn't really go anywhere, never drove out of state, you know, lives a pretty quiet life. You know, that, that over-the-road trucker is going to have a different set of skills. So I'm getting a history. I'm finding out, oh, you've been, you know, you've been scraping up the car and you've banged into, you know, banged into the garage, you've gotten lost a few times, or things are really going fine, or my children are worried, but I don't think they should be. You know, so whatever's going on. So we get that history. And then I look at your vision. Now, I'm looking at more things than the DMV. So the DMV, all they care about, all that's l legally required is that you see clearly enough at a distance and that your peripheral vision is not compromised to more than a certain degree. So that's all they care about when you go to do your license and they stick your face in the, in the little machine. That's all they're worried about. I look at a lot more things. I look at your color vision. I look at that contrast sensitivity to see in, in different lighting conditions, in, in different low contrast. You know, it's easy to see, let's say, these, you know, black lines on, on the ground here, a little harder to see the red ones. The contrast is not as much. So some of these colors that are here on the carpet are higher contrast. The white stands out. The black doesn't stand out as much as the white because it's a gray background. So different kinds of contrast matter. I'm looking at your eye alignment. I'm looking at how well your eyes work together. So I look at a lot of different aspects of your vision, not just can you see clearly. It's more than just that. You need more than that when you drive. We look at your sensory. So are you having numbness, you know, in your feet that's impacting your ability to drive? Uh, do you have significant hearing loss and you're not able to hear the cars that are honking at you that you don't, you think you're fine, but everybody's been honking at you and you can't hear them? Uh, looking at visual perceptual skills. So if you think about, it's not just being able to see clearly. So if I'm coming up, now I had a lady the other day that didn't stop at a stop sign. And she was saying, well, what stop sign? Which it was right there. And she's like, well, it was hidden. Well, it wasn't. Uh, you know, at one point, you know, when you make the turn, okay, you know, it wasn't visible, but it got visible. So her visual perceptual skills were a bit impaired. I look at cognitive function, memory, processing speed, planning. So a lot of different things like that. So all of that gets looked at in the clinic. Then we take you out on the road. We drive around. It's a more complicated route than what we do in this research study. Because the research study is just meant to be pretty basic. I'm doing more complicated things, much more decision making, things like that, because I need to see not only can you handle the car, but can you make the decisions that are necessary to be a safe driver? Because it's not just about staying in your lane and going the right speed. It's about noticing that we entered a school zone and it's active and we need to slow down to 20. Or the person that runs out in the road or the pedestrian who's crossing the street and looking at their phone and not looking at us. So I'm looking at all those different things or making a decision at a complicated intersection. I had a guy that we were at a stoplight and it turned green and the car in front of us, we both started to move, but we were turning left and we started to turn left into the path of the truck. So I stopped us and I said, why did you go? And he goes, well, he had a stop sign. I said, no, we were at a traffic light. You know, he's like, oh, well, then I shouldn't have gone. It's like, no. <laughs> And I'm a little concerned that you didn't know we were just at a traffic light. So, you know, I'm looking at a lot of different things. That wasn't somebody with Parkinson's. But, um, so then you can either pass and, you know, everything's great, everything's good. Pass with some recommendations. You know what, you're fine, but you probably need to stick to your familiar areas. You probably don't need to go on the interstate. You should probably try to drive not in morning rush hour or afternoon rush hour when it's a little bit crazier. So we may give you some recommendations. Yes, you're still driving, but let's just kind of rein it in and only do these things. You could fail. We could end up saying, yeah, you know, you really shouldn't drive. Or it may be a, 
you can drive as long as you're willing to do these things, but if you tell us I'm still going to do what I want, we may have to say to your physician, this person could probably drive if they followed some restrictions, but they're not going to follow restrictions, in which case they're, not, they're going to put themselves in unsafe situations and they shouldn't drive. So sometimes that happens. Um, we do not report you to the state. In some cases, though, if you've gone in, let's say, to get your driver's license and you look a little rickety, the state may report you <laughs> to them, and you may have to come, they may mandate that you come see us to get checked out. Uh, and this is just our phone number, so for folks that are online, this is how you would contact us. Again, over at the booth, I've got all that information so you can pick stuff up there.